As someone who's spent most of my career working on refugees with a focus on Africa, I tend to stay out of debates on British politics and policy as much as possible. But I think events over the last year or so make that impossible. That traditional division between the international and the domestic is no longer tenable. And what I've been asked to explore with you is the question of how Britain can build a post-Brexit development policy. The Prime Minister has spoken of a global Britain, but at the heart of that concept is an inevitable tension. It's built on the idea of attempting to reconcile two competing forces, increasingly pitted against one another, globalization and democracy. That concept itself is the child of Brexit. And Brexit, in turn, represents alienation and fear. It represents a retreat from the vision of an open, inclusive, and liberal society towards the reassertion of boundaries and nationalism. For our purposes, though, it heralds a new politics of development, a politics against the backdrop of which we collectively have to walk a very perilous path. Daily Mail headlines, the Daily Mail seems to be the barometer against which we now judge sections of majoritarian opinion. Its headlines since the referendum include, Britain's foreign aid department pays themselves more than any other ministry. Foreign aid is out of control. Its headline stories have included noting five million pounds to an Ethiopian talk show, money for Chinese football, funding middle-income bricks that have space programs, all ammunition to the nativists. The tabloid media has gone even further in critiquing policies for which there is a strong evidence base. For example, policies on cash transfers have come under scrutiny. In that context, our 12 billion pounds a year aid budget and the 0.7% in which we are one of the world's leaders cannot be taken for granted. The challenge is to reconcile development and democracy. But there are competing visions about how we achieve that. The Secretary of State, Priti Patel, has suggested that we can achieve that through what she's called core conservative principles, transparency, value for money, and crucially, the national interest. But others have suggested there's a danger of overcorrecting course, that Brexit may be used to justify political ends that go too far. The ever sensible Mark Goldring of Oxfam, for instance, has written in The Guardian of these risks, suggesting that aid may become disproportionately used to promote British prosperity and security, that we may miss the point if we marginalize a poverty eradication agenda. But are idealism and pragmatism irreconcilable? I would argue not, that we shouldn't be afraid of looking for convergence between the interests of the British public and our role in the world, but the concept of national interest by itself is nebulous and vague beyond belief and fails to even resonate with the public for which it's a target. So to start with, I want to unpack a little bit what that means, what really lies behind a more substantive notion of reconciling the domestic concern with the international role. First, I think we need to reappropriate patriotic tropes. Aid is traditionally couched in the language of cosmopolitanism, and it's an appeal to the regard for the moral role we have in the world to aid the distant stranger. But such ideas are rarely persuasive. Indeed, I'd argue that aid can also be framed in communitarian terms. We can recall Britain's role in the world in development as, and other areas to support the development project. Ideas such as the history of the kinder transport, the provision of sanctuary to Ugandans fleeing Idi Amin, the idea of the role we played in writing off third world debt. Does anyone today remember the G8 summit in Glen Eagles? Or the role we played in combating sexual violence against women in conflict? All of those have been successes that we've achieved as a country that we can and should be proud of. Second, we should articulate interdependence. The idea underlying the national interest is that what happens there affects what happens here. Interdependence is a truth of globalization. And it doesn't have to always be instrumental. It can also be values-driven. 
We shouldn't shirk the idea that our interests in relation to terrorism, trade, security, can be upheld and supported through a development project. We shouldn't shirk the idea that many justice and home affairs issues are at root development issues. But we must ensure that as we do that, we articulate the interdependence in values-driven terms as well as just instrumental interest-driven terms. Third, we must make sure we're part of the big picture to recognize that when we make the case for international development, it's against the backdrop of a functioning multilateral system. 40% of our aid budget is driven through multilateral institutions. And yet many of those multilateral organizations that we rely on in the development and humanitarian sectors are failing. Beyond multilateral aid reviews, we need to question and begin to reform those organizations who should be driving towards collective action ensuring that our contributions achieve the best they can and that we play a role which reflects our comparative advantage. Against the backdrop of the Trump administration's attempts to cut dramatically their aid budgets and their contributions to multilateral institutions, that reform project is crucial. Fourthly, we must prioritize evidence. Truth matters, facts matter, and we must reassert the evidence. And yet within our sector, too few policies are either evidence-driven or evidence-generating, and all must become that. We must include budgets for baseline studies, impact evaluation, and high-quality monitoring and evaluation. Fifthly, though, a less nebulous national interest project relies upon bringing our skills as a sector home. Now, of course, our core business is international. It's outward-looking. But the development sector has skills that are relevant here in our own society. In the aftermath of austerity, with domestic challenges within our communities, how can we not look to our own countries? In the area I work on of refugees, we go around the world preaching the idea that we should support host communities faced with large influxes of refugees. But why do we not also apply those ideas here to disproportionately support service provision in those areas most affected by migration and refugees? In the time I've got left, I want to flesh out what some of these ideas, part of which are about communications, mean in a substantive policy area, the one I know best. As Lindsay kindly mentioned, I've just co-authored with Sir Paul Collier a new book, Refuge, Transforming a Broken Refugee System. And it outlines how we might think about refugee policies that are fit for the 21st century and compatible with a post-Brexit landscape. At their heart is the challenge of reconciling the seemingly contradictory. On the one hand, we have growing needs for refugees. Displacement is at its highest level since the Second World War. Fragile states mean that more people are on the move, and increasingly, technology creates opportunities for mobility across continents. But on the other hand, we have a backlash against that. Brexit was in part a response to the refugee crisis. The campaign messages of breaking point and take back control were the basis on which the Leave vote triumphed. So how can we reconcile these? Well, I think one thing to do in this area of refuge is to reassert the purpose of refuge to disentangling it from the toxic mess of globalization and migration debates, and, and recognize that the refugee question is not inherently part of that bundle. It can be separated and disaggregated in ways that build public confidence. But to do that, we need to see where refugees are and what the nature of the challenge is. Nearly 90% of the world's refugees are in developing regions of the world. They are not in Europe, or industrialized countries. And around 60% of the world's refugees are in just 10 host countries. Host countries like Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Uganda, Kenya, Iran, Pakistan. It's there that the real challenge lies. And yet the tragedy is that for every one pound we spend here in public money on an asylum seeker, we spend less than one penny on a refugee in those countries. Now, that's not an argument that we're misspending the one pound here, but it is an argument that we're failing to allocate resources in an efficient way to support those where the greatest needs lie. And evidence tells us that our ability to protect those in faraway countries is directly related to onward movement. 
It's no coincidence that in the Syria crisis, until 2014, three years into the crisis, most Syrians remained in neighboring countries. But it was around October 2014 that the change in policies towards restriction in desperately strained host countries, Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan, simultaneously put pressure on outward movement. Of course, the causal relationships are complex, but the relationship is evident and clear. Refuge and providing safe haven is inherently about three tasks. Firstly, a duty of rescue, providing food, clothing, and shelter to people once they flee. But we know that that by itself is not enough. It often leads to long-term encampment. 350,000 people in the Dadaab camps in northern Kenya have been there in most part since the early 1990s. 100,000 of those refugees were born in the Dadaab camps. So secondly, we have another obligation to fulfill with refuge, which is autonomy, ensuring that we provide jobs through development assistance to refugees in ways that also benefit host countries like Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, Uganda, and Kenya. Policies based on development assistance in those countries work. They're not new. They've been effective in Mexico for integrating Guatemalans in the 1990s in ways that benefited the area development of the Yucatan Peninsula. They've been effective in Uganda, now host to a million refugees, but which provides refugees with jobs and self-reliance opportunities. And the UK government is backing uh, pilots in Jordan and Ethiopia to support such jobs. But the third duty, of course, we have towards refugees is to ensure they're not indefinitely stuck in limbo. Yes, ideally, most will ultimately go home, but not all can. And this is where one of the big values caveats has to come in. We need to be able to, beyond an unreasonable cutoff, resettle refugees, but we need to do it in a coordinated way for other states. The Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme of the UK is great in resettling 20,000 Syrians over five years, but it needs to be coordinated with other countries. It needs to kick in at a particular cutoff. Three years in limbo may be acceptable, over 10 years is not. So what does that tell us more broadly as an example? It suggests to me that collectively, we shouldn't be afraid of the national interest and interdependence. But if it's vague and nebulous, it is meaningless. We need to flesh out what that means for us as a sector, what it means for civil society, how we use our communications to appeal to the electorate and take democracy with us. But we also need values to be present, and we shouldn't just have it used as a containment agenda. Finally, three lessons and ideas for you as civil society. First, design policies for the new politics of development. This is an opportunity for ideas entrepreneurship. Globalization creates opportunities that can be win-win and benefit our own communities and societies. Second, build a communication strategy. Your test for that is could you speak about your policies meaningfully in Tendering, Sunderland, Boston? You don't always have to be accountable to those people, but ask yourself what those policies would look like and how you'd articulate them. But thirdly and finally, keep the government in check. There's a tension in the sector. Many of you rely upon governments as your key donors, but also wish to push governments. The way to get that balance is to organize amongst yourselves. Don't be afraid to push an advocacy message that holds the government to account, while also having those of you within civil society that focus on the programmatic and operational agenda. The new politics of development is not easy. In fact, it's probably as hard as standing on a raised lectern with your notes three feet below your nose. <laughs> and I don't claim to have all of the answers, but hopefully I've offered some food for thought. Thank you.